All right, good morning again. We are uh, today continuing along the themes that we had started, looking at prosperity delivered, and uh, we looked at wealth last time, and today we're going to start looking at the concept of health and how they teach on this doctrine. But before I get into this, uh, a few little things I wanted to cover first, uh, and I've, I've mentioned this before near the beginning of the class, but I want to make sure that we say this now for anybody who's word faith that might uh, watch these videos. Uh, I'm not saying that God wants us to be sick. I'm not saying that God wants to punish us and inflict us with disease and death and all that. Uh, that's not the issue. Um, in uh, just recently, well, yeah, last week, I, I have an email prayer list that I, I send out to about 50, 60 different people that pray for my ministry on a regular basis. And uh, this last week, I sent out a prayer request about I, I'm having difficulty with my eyes. You might have noticed in the beginning of the class, I was wearing glasses, and I'm not now because my eyes keep bugging out on me. It's driving me crazy, and I, 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 I pray a lot about this, and I just put a, out a prayer request to my list saying, please pray for my eyes, and told them what some of the problems are. And you know what? People sent back a lot of replies to this, and you know what they said? They said, well, Tim, don't you know that God wants your eyes to be struggling? Don't you know that God wants you to go blind and, and struggle? No, they didn't say anything like that. But the word faith people seem to think that that's what we believe. If, if we're not buying into their doctrine of health, then they think that we believe God wants the opposite of that, that he wants to inflict us. Instead of those kind of responses, people were saying, Tim, I want you to know we're praying for your eyes. We're praying for a total recovery, praying that you make good decisions with your eyes and you know, find good people to help you if God's not going to help you. Well, if not, not, not God's not going to help you, but um, God would lead you to people who could help if he's not going to just heal you outright. Christians who are not word faith believe that God heals, actually. We do. I've seen God heal. I believe God heals, and he will heal. That's not the issue that we take issue with, and we'll see some of those issues as we go through this. Another thing that I want to make sure we make clear in the beginning, I, I referred last time to the idea of pragmatic arguments. And what I mean by pragmatism is when people say that, well, I've tried this system and it works, therefore it must be true. Some people might say, well, I've, I've tried this teaching on the word faith movement, I've seen healing, therefore I know the word faith movement must be true. That's, that's actually a fallacy. That doesn't mean that the system is true if you've tried it and it works. Now, uh, the clip I'm going to show you, this is a guy named Joe McIntyre. He is word faith, and uh, he's a scholar on E.W. Kenyon. E.W. Kenyon is considered to be the grandfather of the Word Faith Movement. Kenneth Hagin is the, uh, uh, the father of the Word Faith Movement. E.W. Kenyon is the grandfather. Uh, he's the guy that most looked to that really got this thing kicked off, and then Kenneth Hagin took it so much further past this. And in this clip, Joe McIntyre is talking about why uh, E.W. Kenyon kind of um, got himself going in this direction of his teaching. Uh, Kenyon wrote these articles because the, 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 a lot of people were being seduced out of the church into these cults uh, because they were seeing healing. And his premise was the church needed to learn to how to pray for the sick effectively so the appeal of Christian science and other cults would be destroyed. You see, it's very interesting how this kind of got started and what was in the mindset of E.W. Kenyon, people were joining Christian science because they were seeing healing. We don't want to say that people should become Christian science because they're seeing these effects and these miracles in their life any more than we should say, well, if somebody's in the word faith movement and it seems to work, they're finding healing, therefore it's valid. No. I mean, that's how, that's what was going on in E.W. Kenyon's day with Christian science. So we can't just assume that this doctrine must be true because it might seem to work. If that were true, then Christian science then would be just as valid. So what we need to do is analyze what are they saying about the Bible and look at the doctrine as a whole, not just it doesn't seem to be working. It should work if it's true, but if it does work, it doesn't mean that it is true. So in our outline, first off, as with wealth, we are cursed with, uh, because of the curse of the law, we have poverty, sickness, and death. Well, the curse is removed with uh, the aspect of health as well. Remember that the blood was shed to redeem us from the curses of the law. And as we partake of the blood, 
sickness and disease, which are major parts of the curse, they leave. As we appropriate his blessing by faith, they leave. That means if somebody's in here today with cancer, and you believe what I'm preaching, cancer is getting ready to exit. The context of that clip was they were just getting ready to do a communion service. And so if you had faith and you partake of the communion, then you can have that healing come to you. Now, so the curse is removed. Another thing they will emphasize is that not that you can be healed, or just healing is available, but that you were healed, you have been healed. It's kind of a past tense thing that a lot of them will emphasize. Your Bible is so emphatic, so clear, you have been healed, as my book I want to send you says, healed once and for all. If Jesus hadn't wanted to heal you, he shouldn't have. <laughs> Healing's not a, a promise, it's an established, established fact. fact. Jesus can bring you the help you need. Gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of salvation the, and the gospel of healing, it's one gospel. If we give the church of Jesus Christ only have the message, we are robbing them of 50%. I have come to Singapore to tell you that salvation is 100%, not 50%. And I have come to remind you I have come to remind you that he was wounded for transgressions, bruised for iniquities, chastised for peace. That's right. That's the front of the cross. But I have come to remind you there's the back side of the cross. With his stripes, we are healed. That's definite. That's the Bible. Jesus is the healer. He is present today. He has already borne your sicknesses and carried your diseases. And by his stripes, you were healed. There's nothing left to do but receive it. Amen. You know what the word receive means? It means take it. We're going to take our healing today because of what God's word says. Jesus himself, the healer, we're taking it. Just like that woman with the issue of blood took it. Because she said it, she kept saying to herself, her faith was working. She had her words going in the right direction. So you were healed. You have already been healed. They tie, they tried to tie the atonement, not just to the forgiveness of sins, but then to healing and to the wealth part as well. And there are only three verses um, that you can look to or that they would point to to show that healing is part of the atonement. Uh, I was just reading a book this, this last week by Paul King, who is Word Faith. Also, he has a book called Only Believe, and he says this as well. There's three verses that can be looked at to show us that uh, healing is uh, part of the atonement. And one of them is here, Isaiah 53. It says, Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. By his wounds we are healed. The other two verses uh, come from 1 Peter 2 and uh, Matthew, which quote this passage. So before we can look at the other two passages, we definitely need to make sure we understand what's going on in Isaiah. Then we can look at the other passages to see uh, exactly how they're using Isaiah and how they back up. Now, Isaiah 53 is a very short chapter, 12 verses, and it gives a snapshot of the life of the Messiah that's going to come. It kind of gives like a, a really quick life history of what things are going to be like with him. In verse 2, it starts talking about the very beginning. He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. So it starts at the very beginning. This is what the Messiah would be like. This is what would characterize his life. Nothing in his appearance that should desire him. I mean, there was nothing about him that people would look at him and go, like, ooh, look at this guy. He's, he's, he's fabulous. Uh, verse 3, he was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. Uh, now, Jesus never suffered for his own sins, but he lived in a world where there was sin. He didn't have sin, but he lived in a world with sin, and because of that, he's going to experience certain hardships in this life. You know, um, people coming against him for things. Have you ever tried to always make the right decision, whether in the workplace or school, and you suffered because of it? You know, I wonder what it was like for him living in a world 
where there was no sin and how frustrated people can get with people sometimes who make the right decision every single time. That would be very frustrating. So he was, he was uh, a man of sorrows, familiar with suffering, like one uh, whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Now, he's not getting to the point of talking about uh, the crucifixion, about the atonement quite yet. He's still talking about the life of the hymn, the coming Messiah, and what it would be like. Then we get to verse 4 and 5, where people are always looking to, to tie the atonement uh, in with healing. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Now, if you look in the King James, originally I was going to do this in King James, but it was awkward enough I felt like I had to describe, to define every word. But in the King James it says he took up our griefs. And so some people might get derailed by that. Well, griefs that come because of infirmities. Infirmities mean sicknesses and diseases and things. He took up our infirmities and he carried our sorrows. Yet we consider him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. I don't think he's talking about the crucifixion yet and the atonement. This is still talking about Jesus before that time. He took up our um, infirmities. He, um, he was burdened by them, and he took these things up. He felt compassion. Think of Jesus standing outside uh, where they had buried Lazarus, and it says Jesus wept. And if you think about who Jesus is in his nature, that should blow our minds. Jesus wept. He was that sad. He's God. He, he should know and understand that he's going to see Lazarus again. But Jesus felt compassion for us. When people came to him for healing, he felt compassion for him. And as God, with the power to heal, what do you do when somebody comes to you with compassion? And you have compassion for them. He healed them. He took up their infirmities. He carried their sorrows. Yet we consider him stricken by God. I find it interesting that in the, the writing of this prophecy, the way Isaiah is put in the position of the people who were against Jesus. And uh, I think that that's kind of a, a good practice to do, to think of us as still being the ones that caused Jesus to live the life he did and to die for us. There was a famous painting, I don't remember who it was, but back in church history somewhere, it's a beautiful painting of, of, of Jesus being crucified, and he's on this cross, and they're nailing it, and the painter put his own face as the guy who's pounding the nail into his hands, because he believed because of his sin is why Jesus was crucified. And Isaiah kind of does this, identifies with the people that were against him. And Jesus had many people against him as he lived his life, doing his public ministry at this point. People were against him. The Pharisees, the teachers of the law, they were against him. They considered him stricken by God, smitten and afflicted. And verse 5 now is where I see it starting to come into the atonement narrative. He was pierced for our transgression. That sounds pretty clear. Now, in Isaiah's day, they would have looked at this and went, would have went, what in the world is he talking about? Now, sometimes until the event happens, you don't really know what was going on. And for, for this, they would have been very confused. He was pierced for our transgressions. Why would the Messiah need to do that? We know that now. Pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Now, the idea of healed at this point, I don't think necessarily is just this physical healing now because of his wounds, his being pierced, that healing has come. But in context, it's talking about the spiritual issue of him dying for sins. Our sins have separated us, us between us and God, according to Isaiah in another passage. And because of that, with him being pierced for us, now that has been met. That is what has brought the healing through his wounds, not necessarily the healing of this physical thing. Now, just moving on from here, I just have a summary. Verses 6 through 8 continues the idea of the atonement um, narrative. It says, all of us like sheep have gone astray, kind of thing in verse 6. Verse 7 was the, he's like a lamb led to the slaughter. And this is definitely the part where it's talking about what Jesus is going to do in the, the crucifixion. Uh, verses 8 through 10a, this is his death. And 10b through 11, his resurrection. And verse 12 gives kind of a quick little snapshot summary of what's been said. So this is what I see going on in Isaiah. Not that it's linking healing to the atonement. Now, let me say also that, well, I believe that there is an effect of the atonement that brings healing. We'll get into that a little bit later. But if, if, if sickness and death comes as a result of sin, well, if the atonement comes, there will be a result where healing is affected. But I don't think that's what Isaiah is talking about here at this point. 
So we have Isaiah, and then we have a couple of other verses that they look to. Matthew chapter 8, it says that Jesus healed all of the sick, and this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. So this to them looks like, see, it shows that Jesus came for the sickness because he healed the sick. Therefore, Isaiah was talking about the sicknesses and diseases that Jesus came to get rid of. However, I mean, we, we have the context right here. Where does it say that uh, he has spoken to, to the prophet Isaiah, he took up our infirmities and carried our diseases? That's referring to verse 4, which I'm saying, this looks like to me, that's about his identification with people in their sorrows and their sicknesses, that he came and he saw them, he identified with them, and he brought healing to them with his compassion. I mean, what a better way to, 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 to lift the burdens of people who are burdened with sickness than to be able to lift them, and he did it. So when he says this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet, not to fulfill bringing the atonement to these people, but to fulfill showing that he is the Messiah talked about in Isaiah 53. He is the Messiah, and his compassion for people and his, the healing of these people is what helps identify him as the Isaiah 53 Messiah. Not that the atonement is now here because he's healing. There's other kind of healings going on that doesn't necessarily mean it's tied to the atonement, and this doesn't seem to be tied to the atonement. So we have this one passage here, and the other one they look at is 1 Peter 2.24. Quotes also says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So now we see it is quoting verse 5, By his wounds we are healed. And he says they bore his sins in his body on the tree. Now it looks, they think now this is looking like he is talking about the atonement. And by the way, in the, the King James, when it says you have been healed, it uses the past since you, you were healed. And that's where we saw some of the word paid teachers a minute ago in the video clip drawn upon the idea that you were healed. You already have been healed. But the healing I would think he's talking about here is that spiritual wholeness that we need to have in God, that forgiveness of sins. That puts it together. But some might say, well, it says he bore our sins in his body on the tree. And where does the word bore come from? If you look at verse 4, uh, when he took up our, our infirmities, and King James, it uses the word bore there, he bare our griefs. Well, it also uses that word in verse 12, too, which it's talking about the atonement of the forgiveness of sins. Now, if this atonement is applied to our lives, there is going to be an implication of healing. But that doesn't mean if the atonement is applied to us, we can then expect a guaranteed healing for us in this life. It just isn't there and it doesn't connect. So these are the only three passages that they have to try to show us that healing is in the atonement. Well, yeah, there's implications of healing in the atonement, but these verses I don't think necessarily say if you have the atonement, you're going to have healing. You know, for one thing, we don't have healing, do we? I mean, does everybody in this room who, who claimed the name of Christ, do you feel like you've been healed past tense of everything? So that raises the question then, doesn't it? Well, if we are healed, these verses say that we are healed or we were healed, then the question is, why are we still sick? Did God make a mistake? Did he forget to heal us? Did he not apply the atonement? If we have faith in Christ, we would think, well, then we have the atonement. Why aren't we healed? It's not a failure of God to heal. It's a failure of ours to receive the healing. It's not a failure of God to save. It's our failure in not receiving salvation. So it's not God's fault if you're not healed. It, he, he has done what he has to do. Now it's on our part to make sure that that healing happens. So what are we going to do? We want to know how to make this healing happen. So for the word faith folks, what would they say? A few different things we need to make sure. Number one is don't ask for healing. Don't go to God and say, God, please heal me of this. That's almost like, to them, they would say that's almost like doubting God, that he even provided the healing. The healing has been accomplished by his stripes. You were healed. So you don't go to God and you ask for it. You could take that one psalm right there and you could do away with the tradition that says, Lord, if it be thy will, heal him. Don't even bother to pray for me if you're going to pray that. If you don't know enough about the Word of God to know it's God's will to heal, you can't pray the prayer of faith, and so you might as well just stay home. 
you to cut down off prayer time. And instead of you begging God to heal you, just get healed through faith in the blood and enjoy your prayer time. And now you're not just praying to get God to do something. You're praying because you're fellowshipping. Interesting, huh? Don't, don't pray and ask God to be healed. And don't say, if it be your will, that's, that's weakness. That's, uh, that's not strong. That's not faith. No, you just need to claim that. So the next thing we need to do, if we want to bring this healing, is we need to ignore the symptoms that we are not healed. If, we, if we're thinking we're not healed, it's probably because we're paying attention to these symptoms here. So if we want to live long and live strong, we can't be talking weakness and doubt and sickness and disease. We can't say, well, would you pray for my arthritis? You don't want that arthritis. That's not your arthritis. You can say, I've been diagnosed with arthritis. Would you pray for me? But don't say my sickness, my arthritis. No, it's not mine. I'm, I'm not taking it. You, when we pray, you believe you receive regardless of whether you can tell a difference or not. That's just the way faith works. And then it, 30 minutes from now and you have a pain, don't undo it. Don't quit. You have to keep saying the same thing. If you believe you received it, don't believe you didn't receive it 30 minutes later. You either get on or get off. So isn't that interesting? You can have the, the symptoms of things, but um, not have it somehow is how they're thinking. So if you have the symptoms of being sick, you, you don't claim that. You don't admit it. You don't say it. You have to keep on saying you are healed. And at this point then, to bring the rest of this home to make sure we get our healing, what we need to do is release our healing. We don't now ask for the healing, as we've said, now we need to release that healing in our lives. Now you're watching, and I want to pray for each of you watching that has a blood problem. Whether it's age, leukemia, whatever the blood issue is, we want to pray for you. I want to pray for you right now. Father, I send the word into these areas into these arteries into these veins father into the marrow and i thank you right now that the blood of jesus sets them free cleanses them washes them from every kind of infirmity and i thank you father for each person watching who even needs a transfusion that the blood of jesus would come in clean and and absolutely restore replace whatever is broken whatever is missing whatever is malfunctioning would replace and improve that area of need Receive it. Say, I receive my healing. It is the will of God for me to be healed. I receive it now. I'm made whole. I can do what I couldn't do before. I am healed. In Jesus' name. Now, now act on it. Do, could, do what you couldn't do before. If you couldn't bend over, bend over in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. So we release our healing. We don't ask for it. We don't pray to God. And I, it's interesting how Creflo Dollar characterized that before, begging God to heal. Please, God. You know, it's like we're begging God. Well, I don't think necessarily God wants us to be begging him. Nobody's suggesting that either. But we can go to God and we ask him to heal. Not begging, but we can have fellowship. We don't need to beg God to heal according to this. We know we need to release that healing and cause that to come. And you might have even noticed there's, uh, they, they contradict themselves in the way they even talk about it. You say that you were healed, but now you're supposed to release your healing. Well, why would you release your healing if you've already been healed past tense? Now, they might think that's getting really picky, showing little internal contradictions here and there, but you, you see this quite a bit. Now, just like when we talked about wealth, we get to this point in health, people are starting to get a lot of questions in their head like, well, how does this fit with that? How does this fit with another thing? And one of them might be, you're thinking right now is, well, what about death? Don't people die? If you head shake and yes, you're thinking that, well, people die, right? How do they explain that? If, if you can be healthy and claim this healing, why would you ever die? Well, your healing can be lost. See, you can actually lose your healing. You, you can get healthy. You can claim your healing. You can go through this process. You speak faithful words. You bring healing into your life. But then you could actually lose the healing. Kenneth Hagin explained that 
like when you see the big miracle cru crusades with Benny Hinn or um, different things that he would do, people would get healed. And he would say that afterwards that person might have lost their healing because they were healed because of the, um, the collective faith of everyone in the room helped channel God's healing into that person. And then when they left, they needed their own faith in order to keep the healing going. So you can actually lose the healing and not maintain it. Um, this next clip I have here to talk about the same theme that healing can be lost. This is probably one of the funniest clips that I'm going to show you. This, this one is just my, one of my favorites. I don't bring this up to, uh, to mock them, but this is Paula White talking about losing healing. And there's a flow of God getting ready to come to you like you have never, ever known before. But you have to give a seed like the leper who when the, the ten were healed and only one, they say that nine didn't go back and say thank you. Most historians say the nine lost their healing. Did you get that? Most historians will say that the nine lepers that didn't thank Jesus, they lost their healing. Where are these historians? I, I've uh, studied in church history, and that's where I got my master's degree. And through all the professors I had, none of them pointed out to me that the nine lost their healing. The only thing that I can imagine that would make sense with this is maybe those, nine, those, those historians know that those nine lepers are dead, and that's why they lost their healing. Well, I would guess that the first leper is dead, too. I don't know how she could make such a bold statement as that, that most historians would say that the nine lost their healing. But nevertheless, if you want and you keep maintaining these principles, you can keep in faith throughout your life and keep your healing. Does that mean you get to be 60 or 70 and then you, you, you have to fall apart? Not according to this. It says the Word of God will keep you through old age. Now, we're not going to live forever, but according to this, we can be strong and well and blessed and kept until we leave here at whatever age that is i'm in so you can be well and healthy through old age still the question is well then why would people die you get that way all the way up until old age well then you die why would you die i don't have any clips for you on this but i do have some verses that they would use kenneth copeland would point you to philippians chapter 1 verse around verses 21 through 24 where Paul is struggling with whether he should be alive or dead. He said that, you know, there's, there's benefit being here with you all, and there's benefit with being with Christ, definitely more benefit for him being with Christ, but people are benefited by him being here. And he says, um, I am hard-pressed from both directions, whether to depart and be with Christ or to remain and be a benefit with you all. And he would say, Kenneth Copeland using this verse, or other word faithers would say that, see, there's an implication then that you have uh, the decision in your own death. And when God calls you, when it's your time, then you use those faithful words to be obedient to God's call, and you die. The reason other people die is because we're listening to the devil who tells us that you're going to die. So we speak those negative confessions. We say, oh yeah, I'm probably going to die from this disease, or I don't think that I'll ever get better, and I know that I'm going to die probably when I'm 70. You speak those faith-filled words, those negative faith-filled words, and you cause your own death. So you can use your words to cause your own death when it's supposed to go, or you can maintain health as long as you would want. They would also point to Deuteronomy 34 when it talks of Moses when he died. It says when he died that his eyes were not dim, and I forget the rest of how it characterizes, but he still had his strength. He died in health. He died when it was God's appointed time for him. He wasn't allowed to go into the promised land, so it was time for him to die, and he died in health. We all can have that as well. We can die in health. Interesting how far that they will take that. Now, one problem with this is it doesn't seem to work even for some of the top word faith folks. And I don't bring up the subject of Kenneth Hagin's death to take any kind of enjoyment from it at all. He's, he's a person created... Uh, in the, after the image of God, and uh, we don't take any enjoyment in it, but it's interesting to look at how he died to see how these principles function in his life. Kenneth Hagin said that he first started teaching these things and understanding them in 1933 after God healed him from a heart condition. He was uh, in a hospital, in a bedridden, with this heart problem, and he started understanding these principles, studying Mark chapter 11, verses 24, uh, speaking faithful words. He brought healing, total healing to his heart. Well, September uh, 2003, he died 
from heart problems. From what I understand, uh, he collapsed in his home and he was in intensive cardiac care in the hospital for around nine or ten days and then eventually passed. He did not die in health. And you'll see some of the word faith people will, will try to say that Kenneth Hagin died in health. No, he was in intensive care for almost two weeks. And the thing that he died from is the thing that was supposedly cured from him from the beginning. I don't take any enjoyment in that. That's really sad. I feel bad for his kids and grandkids that are left from that, but it didn't work in his life. He died from these things. So it doesn't work the way that they say. Before we get to the next session, section on uh, salvation, I just wanted to give one little response here. Actually, a couple. Uh, number one, um, th there's kind of an inconsistency that uh, they come to when we talk about going to the doctor. Like, should we go to the doctor is the question. If you were going to be in the system and believe what they're teaching, should you go to the doctor? Now, let me give you a personal example with myself. I've broken my arm. And though I broke my arm, I'm not going to go to the doctor. I'm not going to go get a cast on. I'm not going to have a splint. I'm not going to get any medications for the pain. When my arm broke, there was pain, definitely. But I'm not going to the doctor because I believe that I'm healed completely. Past tense. I have been healed. I know that I've been healed, so I'm not going to the doctor. Part of the reason why I know that I'm healed is this happened 30 years ago. I was a teenager, and I was chasing the ice cream truck and uh, fell and broke my arm. And it hurt. I did go to the doctor at that point because it hurt. The reason you would go to a doctor is because you... In that situation, the reason I went to a doctor is because I broke my arm. And I was pretty sure I broke my arm. And if I didn't break my arm, I knew something significant enough had happened that I needed to go to a doctor. Now, with the word faith teachers, when asked the question about going to the doctor, some few might say, don't go to the doctor. Um, so there's two, two answers. Go to the doctor or don't go to the doctor. Charles Capps, in this is his book, uh, The Tongue, A Creative Force, he talks about this idea of doctors. He says, don't let Satan condemn you or, uh, don't let, sa uh, don't let Satan condemn you over taking medication. God wants you well. If your faith is not developed to that point, for God's sake, don't suffer 39 years and say, I trusted the Lord. No, if you suffered 39 years, you missed it somewhere. That is not God's will for you. Get some medical help. Get back on your feet. Then get in the word of God and find out where you missed it. Learn to control your circumstances instead of allowing them to control you. So it's okay to go to a doctor. If you're sick and suffering and this isn't working, okay, go to a doctor until you get this figured out. And it starts working. So in this view, what, what he would say, and I think there's even one web website on one of the word faith teachers I looked at, called it an extreme view to say, no, don't go to the doctor. So the answer, yes, would be the reasonable one. If you're still sick, if that arm is broken, you got a bone sticking out or something, well then, yeah, go to a doctor if you're not bringing that healing in. But this doesn't really float with me, to call it an extreme view to say no. Because if you think about it, that would be the reasonable view. This is what I would call, instead of the extreme view, that's the reasonable view. And the word yes would be a contradictory view, not, not, the, not the reasonable view. And the reason I would say this is the only reason I would go to that doctor is because I believed something was wrong with my arm. I might not have known it was broken at the time, but I knew something was wrong, and I go to the doctor because I believed I needed medical attention. What they're telling us is believe that you are healed. I'm not going to the doctor right now because I believe I am healed. Past tense, that healing is done and complete and gone. It's over with. I am healed. I'm not going to the doctor now. The only reason I'd go to the doctor is if I believed I needed it. I believed I was sick. I believed I had the cancer. I believed my arm was broken. That's why you go to the doctor. They're telling us, believe you are healed. Ignore those symptoms. Don't go to the doctor. It seems to be the reasonable response from what they're saying. Don't go to the doctor is reasonable. Saying go to the doctor is contradictory. And, you know, just in what I read here, you know, again, he says, get some medical help and get back on your feet. Well, why go to the get the medical help if they're trying to help us convince ourselves that we are healed? 
the, the only reason that this doesn't work, they would say, is maybe maybe you're not growing spiritually. Maybe you aren't really believing your healing. And that's why you're not receiving the healing. You're not really believing it. Then telling you to go to the doctor is going to help cement your lack of belief that you're healed. That's a contradiction. That's the speaking with the forked tongue. Believe both things. Believe you're healed and believe that you're not healed. This doesn't work. It's contradictory. The, the, the last section here on prosperity delivered would be the subject of sal salvation. And salvation is, well, number one, is accessed by faith. So they would be in agreement with the way uh, evangelical Christians would see this. If you acknowledge, verse 9, because if you acknowledge and confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord, and in your heart you believe, trust in, and rely on the truth that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what do we need to do to be saved? We need to believe in our heart, confess with our mouth. Romans 10, 9, and 10 is like a pattern. Whatever you want from God, you got to believe it in your heart, confess it with your mouth. With words, we can reach into that spiritual realm and we can begin to pull things out that are God's will for us and get them over here into the realm where we can make use of them. Words have power. So you can see an element of definitely the truth in the gospel there about believing in your heart, confessing with your mouth to be saved. However, did you see just in the very use of those verses, then she used the very same verses as a way for us to gain access to material possessions and to health, use those positive confessions to speak those things into our world and into our life. So we can see an element of the gospel there, but even in it, we can see that the gospel is it's often downplayed and it's elevated the concept of then wealth and health. Those are the more important things because those are the things we have now. Yeah, the, the, the future state of being with God, yeah, that's important and we need to have that and the gospel is spoken, but now the emphasis comes down on health and wealth. Oh, Brother Copeland, I thought salvation is the, is the gospel. Yes, it is, and salvation is part of the blessing. Healing is part of the blessing. Prosperity is part of the blessing. Heaven in your future is part of the blessing. Sometimes we live more at the crucifixion than the resurrection. He's been resurrected, and he sat down once and for all. And so those benefits are ours. And the benefits of that she's talking about are the health and wealth kind of aspects of it. So now the focus becomes on what we can benefit from it here in this life, or the way Frederick Price put it the other day, well, no, was it... Uh, Bill Winston, you know, we get the, we can get saved, but now we need to get that recompense, which we deserve because of it. And this is where now, to me, the gospel is starting to get shifted with their focus. Um, you, I don't believe that I'm saved because I, I spoke and power was released, causing my salvation. If you start to define faith as this release of energy and release of power, I have to say, no, I don't think I was saved that way. I was I say because I recognized my spiritual lostness and emptiness before God and came to God empty and bankrupt spiritually and said, if you don't save me, there's no hope for me. And I trusted God for my salvation. And that was faith, as I understand faith in the scriptures. And the way they're defining and using faith, it sounds okay, and you can, I can see people here get saved through this. However, then the whole direction they're pointing them is not necessarily towards that salvation. The last clip that I have here on salvation, this is Joyce Meyer again. And a lot of these clips, I've, I've listened to them so many times as I edit and try to figure out where I'm going to use them in different presentations. And I've heard this one many, many times. And when I taught this uh, last time, just last year, it dawned on me there's an element of this that I've totally missed, which makes this to be one of the most, more shocking things, I think, that... Joyce Myers has said when you put it in context. How many of you believe that there are wonderful things already arranged for in the spiritual realm for you if you could just get them out of the spirit and get them here where you're living? You know, we've all heard those stories about all the things that are up in heaven waiting for us and how when we get there we'll all be disappointed because of all the packages that we never opened, you know. 
Now, I don't know if it goes exactly like that or not, but I think there's a certain amount of, of truth to that. I think that there's a lot of things that God has for all of us that we just don't seem to know how to get out of that spiritual realm. So what I want to point out here is the view that she's painting of the afterlife. And I don't know a view that you have of, of what it will be like in heaven. Some of us have this, this picture in our mind of, of after you die. I don't know if you see us all on a big cloud or uh, an earth-like atmosphere as a big park. But the focus in my mind of what that is, is we're seeing this incredible throne of God with angels worshiping and us being able to participate and take part in this. And I don't want to say at all that what Joyce Myers just said characterizes the way all of them are going to see the afterlife. But did you, did you hear what she suggested? That we could possibly even be there and stop and feel a loss because we realize we could have more stuff in this life. So not only is there this focus and emphasis on the healing and wealth in this life, but even in the afterlife, we could even stop and consider, man, I could have had a better car back when I was alive. That is not the gospel. That is not what they're trying to point us to. It's more of what can happen in our life now, what we can have and what we can receive. And that is not the true gospel. The true gospel is about God and his glory. And we're going to get into some of that uh, more in a bigger response but uh, we're out of time for now, so we're going to start uh, more of an overall response to some of these things next week and uh, look forward to that. So we'll see you then. Thank you.